Phil Rosenthal stars and creates and is the executive producer of Somebody Feed Phil, probably the best show for the times we're living in now as he travels around the world sampling various cuisines and cultures. I'm Tony Ruiz of Gold Derby. And um, Phil, you know, I, I think the first question that I always ask is, I always wanted to ask this, is it just how much fun is it to do this show? Because you look like every episode that you're having the absolute time of your life. It's all right. <laughs> uh, you're talking to the luckiest guy that you're ever going to talk to. That's really how I feel. Look what I get to do. I mean, I know, I know uh, people that uh, who don't like me hate me uh, because, of, <laughs> because I get to do this, right? It's a dream come true. It, I will tell you, it makes you feel better. Uh, it took about 10 years to get the show. It was not easy. You know, they don't hand dreams out like this to, to just anybody. And it, there's no real need for it when you're pitching it, right? So uh, it, it took some doing. I really had to prove myself in, in little, little clips and, little, and, and really putting putting myself out there and, and it was scary to do in a way uh, because I'm from behind the camera. And, and it was also, I thought, a dream. I, if I thought if I was going to knock my head against the wall, meaning show business, <laughs> I may as well pick that part of the wall that I really, really liked, right? So for me, I love every aspect of show business. I always say this. I love writing, acting, directing, producing, entertaining, editing, ev everything. Every, I love every aspect of show business except the business, right? So I thought if I'm going to knock my head against the wall, pick the wall you really, really like. Because I tried to do sitcoms again after Raymond. It just, the style of sitcom and the type of humor that I thought I was okay at it wasn't really in fashion anymore. It could have been my age, I don't know, or it could have been the times, and it could have been the world and the way the world is. You know, Raymond was, for all intents and purposes, a, a, a clean show, meaning it was not sex-driven, although we had our sex jokes. It's just that those jokes were kind of, um, we thought, going over the heads of, of kids so that if you watch the show, you could watch it with grandma or your eight year old and, and not worry. We actually thought that was good writing. We thought that, that not to be so blunt. Well, the world got blunter, I found, in the <laughs> nine years that we were doing that show. And the type of show that I wanted to do, and the type of humor that I could do, it, it just didn't seem welcome anymore. I was pitched a lot of things that I did not want to do. You know, to be fair, I didn't want to do them either. So they didn't want what I was pitching, and I didn't want what they were pitching. So then I had had this dream of doing the, the travel show for years. And, and so I thought, let's pursue that a little bit, see what happens. Well, and then so, you, you know, you call it, it's so much, it's to me so much more than a travel show because it is not just the, the, the locations, which are phenomenal, and the food, of course, which, you know, I could gain 30 pounds just watching uh, an episode, um, but it's also the people and the culture. So uh, do you think all those three things are, are basically meshed together, or do you see them differently? They're all meshed together, and I call food the great connector, right? And, and that's why I use it because it connects us all. And for me, if food is the great connector, laughs are the cement. That, that's where I'm using where I come from, right? And, what I, and the only thing that I could bring to this genre, a genre, you know, kind of uh, reinvented and, and perfected by Anthony Bourdain. You know my line, I, I sold the show by saying, I'm exactly like Anthony Bourdain if he was afraid of everything. <laughs> and so the only way that I knew that I could bring something new was to bring my background as a sitcom writer 
uh, or, or, or my stupid sense of humor and my love of food. And I found that people like food. These shows seem to do well. And if I added humor to it and a kind of uh, every Schlemiel uh, <laughs> point of view, I could, I could maybe have a niche in that, in that field, right? Well, so, and, and so, but one of the things that, that I find so kind of fascinating about the show is that, you know, it, it's, it's not just a show about like, you know, these super fancy restaurants. No. It's, it's very much, you know, these are places that everybody can go to. Why was that, why did that, why was that important to you? It's where I want to go. Listen, if you're going to do it, right? You want to, you know, I'll tell you something. We did an iteration of this show in my, in my attempt to try to sell it somewhere. I was approached by American Express years ago. I want to say six, seven years ago. Uh, they heard I was interested and they thought, okay, here's something. We're going to send you to London with Thomas Keller. You know who he is? The best chefs in the world. And we're going we're gonna, to uh, film you for a week going to restaurants. So the producer of that segment, now I thought this was a pilot for a series, but it wasn't. I didn't know going in. They, they had no intention of making a series. They were going to cut up whatever footage we had and show it at a special evening or two evenings with their gold card members, like a, a card member experience. <laughs> and so the restaurants that we went to were all gold card worthy, meaning fancy white tablecloths, three, four hour dinners. By the second day, I didn't want to eat anymore, right? You know, when the food comes, you want to go, oh boy, not, oh no. And I was dying and it wasn't fun. And so I learned from that. You can learn as much about what not to do as you can what to do when you work on stuff, right? So that, this was a great learning experience to me. Thank God that didn't become a series because I would be dead already <laughs> from just from the food. It's not how anyone really eats. I've met very few people who want to have the three-star Michelin meal every night even on vacation. There are those people, but uh, you don't want to talk to them. <laughs> anyway, they, they, I, you, I, I'd much, wouldn't you rather have, if you go to a town, the best hot dog in town, rather than the pretentious, big, fancy four hour dinner that isn't gonna be the one of your life. It's gonna be in that style and it's gonna be the thing, but it's not going to be the, the most mind-blowing once in a 10-year dinner. It's just yeah. going to be pretend. That actually, that actually reminds me, that reminds me, I think in the first season when you were in, um, I think it was Bangkok, I want to say, where you went to this, this place where I think the entire dinner was maybe a dollar. Um, yes, my favorite. So you're just hit on the one, like, like one of my favorite things we ever did. This shack in Chiang Mai, Thailand. Thailand, in the, in the middle of nowhere, bowl of cow soy, which is a coconut curry broth with some chicken or beef in it and fresh noodles and crispy noodles on top and spicy and, oh my God, it's, I, I'm, I'm, my mouth is watering thinking about it. It's a <laughs> dollar, which is my second favorite price. <laughs> yes, and I would rather have that right now than anything fancy well i want to i want to talk about one of the i think one of the highlights of this particular season um i think was the south korea episode oh thanks there that there and especially that middle section where you talk to the 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 young lady who had you know had uh fled from uh from north korea jesse yeah and it was so fascinating and moving the the contrast between you know, her leaving that country, and I think you said it in the episode of her leaving that country and yet still wanting the foods of, of, her, of her culture. Uh, how did you get in contact with her? How did, that, how did that come about? Well, I do have a production company called ZPZ. They're based in New York, and they used to be Bourdain's production company. So they have, they have boots on the ground in every place on earth because that show went for 18 years. So I really am at an advantage having such experience behind me. 
I also do research, as anyone can do when they go on vacation, by looking on the phone and looking for uh, best uh, restaurants in Korea, or let's get specific, North Korean food in Seoul, right? So there is that place. There is, there's, there's a few of them. This was the, the good one. This was the best one. And we thought this was pitched to me by the production company. Would you be interested in talking to, because I, oh, I, do, I do have a couple of mandates that I, that I tell them. It can't just be about food. If it was just me eating, it would be boring. So I'm looking for something cultural, something charitable, right? Something to do between meals, <laughs> sightseeing, anything to break it up, to break up the hour so it's not just food. So they present me with this, would you be interested in talking to someone who runs this operation uh, of rescuing North Korean people who have escaped? And, and uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 what's the word? Uh, repatriating them into, into South Korea. And not only can I meet with this guy, we can meet one of his client. And that's Jessie. You don't know how great she's going to be, how moving it's going to be. I had no idea how moving the food part of it would be, which is like a triple home run. It's a grand slam to have not just her story, but to tie in so beautifully with what your whole show's about. That's luck. Absolute luck. You pray for that when you're making a documentary. When you turn on the cameras, when you're making a documentary, you pray something happens. Something has to happen. Otherwise, you know, it's just me eating. <laughs> Boring. Something has to happen. And if it doesn't happen, you know what? You don't have to use it, right? So what you're seeing is people say, Phil, it looks like you, you like everything. It looks like you like all the... F yes, I like everything I'm showing you. What kind of show would it be if I went, okay, here it is. No, it's all right. <laughs> I'm trying to get you to come. I'm trying to get you to travel because I think there's no more mind expanding thing we can do in life than travel. You're not going to meet Jesse sitting at home. You're not going to hear that story, right? So, one of my enticements is the food. And look what it did for her. Oh my God. I could cry thinking about it. I'll be honest. Uh, what a story. I hope everybody watches that. And I hope everybody watches something closer to home, the Chicago episode. I don't know if you got to see that. Uh, I, I watch it religiously. <laughs> oh, thank you. But that was very, very special and moving to me as well. Because we didn't highlight the fancy schmancy Chicago very much. We focused on a lot of the South side of Chicago and, and a lot of our black friends and, and it seemed to have been made for today. I would recommend that to you to watch today. Well, and, and I think another, another highlight for me was the, uh, was the Marrakesh episode because that's not a place that you necessarily think of when you're thinking of traveling. And, and I remember you sitting and having dinner with that family overlooking this huge kind of valley. Yes. And just being completely drawn in by it. Yeah. So I think one of the things that I always wonder is how do you, what's your process for picking a, a, a location? So because I would say we're still in our infancy, right? I did six shows for PBS another 12 for Netflix, and now you're seeing another five. That's not very many. And the way I thought I would get you to travel, especially Americans who don't even have a passport, two thirds of Americans don't have a passport. So if I'm gonna motivate you to travel, shouldn't I start with Earth's greatest hits, right? The best stuff? To me, Marrakesh is still near the top of that list because First of all, everyone told me how great the food is and how beautiful and exotic it is, which again, do just the most cursory search on your phone and look at some photos. And if you've ever seen Casablanca or any movie set in Morocco or anything set there, it's kind of been this exotic fantasy to go. And then when you're there and it's beyond your expectations uh, of fantastical, 
and then you start meeting the people and then you start having the experience and then you're hearing the call to prayer from all the mosques all around you you start to realize the other life out there that you had no idea existed and is so beautiful it sends you back home with this new perspective that's the beauty of travel to experience the other and to get it which you can't do just watching a show that's why i implore you to stop watching and go as soon as we can as soon as we can and let me just say this we're in a terrible time right now um, uh, it's, it's tragic what's happening, but I'm also hopeful and optimistic that it will end and that we will go again and the world will be there waiting for us, right? And the reason I'm so confident in saying that is because it's ended every other time there's been something terrible, right? Well, yeah, and, and I think, I think there's, a, there's also a kind of a timeliness uh, to this series just in general because of, I think one of the effects of what's happening right now is the restaurant industry. Um, yes. and, and that's something you're really, really passionate about. I think. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you see how much I love it, but I don't think I'm alone. I think our social lives exist in restaurants. It's where you and I would go for a drink or to have a, a celebration or to meet for the first time over lunch. Right. And then if we get along, we're going to have another lunch and maybe our wives are going to meet. We're going to have dinner. It happens in restaurants, our lives. If there's not a specific bailout in America for restaurants, which are the second biggest employers of people in the United States after the United States government, because when you factor in not just the 11 million people who work in restaurants, but when you factor in the suppliers, the farmers, the winemakers, cheesemakers, everybody, now you're talking about like 20 million people. This is a gigantic sector of the population. In a lot of ways, restaurants are the safety net of employment even, right? If, if you were to, God forbid, lose your job, I dare say that the, the one place you could work if you had to would be a restaurant, right? Doing something. It's so necessary on top of so enjoyable it's it's we're we're inextricably tied to it but if we're not careful the only restaurants left are going to be fancy schmancy for mr and mrs expense account and corporate chains like wendy's burger king mcdonald's for everybody else and all the restaurants that you and i value the diner the coffee shop the mom and pop italian or Korean, or Chinese, or Indian, or Mexican, how are they going to survive? How are they going to survive? It's not this way. People think, oh, they're open again. No, they're not really open again. They can't really sustain this because they're operating at way less than capacity. You know how small the margins are anyway to make a profit in a restaurant. Then throw this at them, and then don't support them with money. Not good. So we have to support them. Uh, I want anybody listening, if you go to uh, my, uh, my website or my, my Instagram and you go to the World Central Kitchen link there and you donate, I'm going to match every donation. I think because they're employing, Jose Andres is employing restaurants and restaurant workers to make food for people who need it. So it's a, it's a win-win for, for, for me to support that. I think that's a, that's a really, really important thing because it is, you're right, it is what we as a culture uh, rely on is that intimacy and that, that, that bond that, yep. like you said, food is definitely a bonder. The great connector. Yeah. True. Uh, um, Phil Rosenthal, uh, uh, it, it's just, it's, it's one of my favorite shows. It's just Thank something you. that I enjoy and look forward to every time there's new episodes. Um, everybody go to goldderby.com, make your predictions for the Emmys, and stay tuned for more interviews throughout the season. Uh, Phil Rosenthal, uh, congratulations, thank you. A great pleasure talking to you. I hope to see you again.